Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, our Savior, God's grace, His mercy, His peace have been shown to you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. See if you can finish this saying. If at first you don't succeed, yeah, there you go. You did better than first service. Okay, they needed two tries. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. Maybe a coach, a parent, maybe even a teacher has attempted to encourage you with those words somewhere along the line. Those words are attributed to a 19th century teacher who wanted to encourage his students not to give up when they found something difficult to do, but to keep on working at it, trying and trying and trying until they succeeded and finally accomplished whatever it was that they had initially set out to do. That phrase came to mind as I heard Jesus in our gospel lesson for this morning speaking that parable about the widow and about the unjust judge. Jesus was trying to encourage his students, if you will, his disciples, you and me, to not give up but to be persistent in our prayers. And yet, as we study this parable together this morning, I, I think that we see that Jesus' definition of what a successful prayer is might be a little bit different than what our initial definition of a successful prayer would be. When we listen to this parable of Jesus, it's one of the, the shortest parables that Jesus tells. It's actually quite simple. It only has two main characters. First of all, you have the judge, the judge who isn't a real nice guy. The judge is a person who Jesus describes as a person who neither feared God nor cared about men. The judge was a type of guy who only cared about himself, caring very little about the people around him. He was going to do what he wanted to do, when he wanted to do it, however he wanted to do it. And if you didn't like it, tough luck. He didn't care what God thought about his decisions. He cared even less about the people around him and how his decisions would affect those people that he was supposed to be governing and caring for. Now maybe you've had the unpleasant experience of working or living among such a person. You know, the grouchy person in the neighborhood who nobody really likes to be around or the, the person at work that everybody tries to avoid the person that is really the last one that you ever want to go to when you need help or you need a favor, that's what this judge was like. Well, then you have the other main character in this parable, and this is this little poor widow. A widow who the Bible tells us had an adversary, an enemy, some person in her life who found great joy in making this woman's life difficult. And this widow went to the judge in order to seek justice, to seek some deliverance from this enemy, this adversary. And not surprisingly, what did the judge do? Nothing. And so what did the widow do? She kept going back. Over and over again, she pleaded her case before the judge. Now stop and think about that. This woman really had every reason in the world to give up. The judge was well known for caring little about justice. Why would she ever think that he would care about her? This judge repeatedly made it clear to this widow that he had no intention in the future of answering her request. And yet, what did the widow do? The widow kept going back day after day, week after week, who knows, maybe month after month, maybe even year after year to plead her case before the judge until finally the judge gives in and gives her what she had requested and brought her the deliverance from her adversary that she had sought. And this is the point that we arrive at in every one of Jesus' parables we ask the very Lutheran question, what does this mean? 
What is Jesus' point with this parable? And the opening words, as Jesus introduces this parable, actually tell us. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. The point of Jesus' parable is simple, isn't it? Jesus calls us to be persistent in our prayers. To continually, repeatedly bring our requests before the Lord, trusting that He will answer every one of our prayers. And Jesus' parable tells us why we should have such confidence. While that widow in the parable had no reason to think that the judge would ever answer her, God is giving you and me every reason to trust that God will answer our prayers. Why? Because we approach a God who is not belligerent or ambivalent of our needs. No. We approach a judge that, well, Martin Luther described that God that we approach in prayer. With the explanation to the introductory words of the Lord's Prayer, Our Father in Heaven, God reminds us that we, when we approach Him in prayer, we approach God as dear children approach their Father in heaven. Now last weekend, families all across the United States were celebrating Father's Day. And usually on Father's Day, what do we focus on? We try to focus on the good things that dads have done. I've yet to see the Hallmark card that celebrates Father's Day by saying, Dad, let me tell you how terrible of dad you are. Let me list the reasons. No. We focus on the good things that dads have done. And yet, not a single dad could possibly say that they've done it all right. There have been times where there have been selfish decisions, where there are things that have been done or said that you wish you could change or wish you could take back. When it comes to our Father in heaven, He has done everything perfectly. No regrets. There's nothing that He's said or done in the past that He looks back to and He regrets or wishes He could take back or change. Because our Heavenly Father's record is one of absolutely perfect love for you and for me. The Apostle John described that perfect love of our Heavenly Father with these words. He says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Just think about that. God the Father loved you so much that He was willing to sacrifice His only perfect Son's life in your place. For you and for me who, let's face it, on more occasions than we would like to admit, have been sinful embarrassments to our Heavenly Father. For you and for me, whose conversations have often been filled with condescension and gossip, even about our fellow Christians. For you and for me, who have dishonored God by thoughtlessly using His name with such exclamations as, Oh my God! Or Oh my Lord! For you and for me, who have given God plenty of reasons for Him not to love us. God shows the perfect heart of a loving Father as He gives His Son's life in your place and mine. As He puts upon Jesus the punishment of all of our sins so that you and I could be called His sons and daughters through faith. And so that each and every day of our life, we could look to God as our Heavenly Father who loves us perfectly, who has brought us the forgiveness of sins and who has promised us eternal life in heaven. That is the Father's love that you and I have experienced through faith. And so how could we not join with the Apostle John then in exclaiming, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. With such a heavenly Father to approach in our prayers. How could we? Why would we even think about it for a moment to give up? To give up on Him or to stop going to Him with our prayers? Well, 
Jesus identifies some of the temptations that oftentimes plague Christians when it comes to our prayer life. In the concluding words of this parable, Jesus says this, And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I want to go back to the first question that Jesus begins with. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? It's kind of a rhetorical question, isn't it? The answer is obvious to us. We might join together in saying, well, of course. Of course, God, the perfect, perfectly just and loving Heavenly Father, of course he will answer every one of our prayers. But how long are you willing to say that before you're tempted to give up and to stop asking? When you look at the world around you and it seems like wickedness is winning, when you wake up the next morning and realize you still have the same problems you had the day before, when you look at the world around you and you see bad people doing bad things to seemingly innocent people, are you ever tempted to ask, where's God in all this? Is God just going to turn a blind eye and let this keep on going? Where is God and his justice? We pray repeatedly together and deliver us from evil. And yet it seems like evil continues to increase. Dear friends, do not be fooled by the appearance of things. Or when life might seem unfair or unjust to you in your eyes. Instead, lift your eyes to the Lord in prayer. For the Lord invites us to come to him in prayer and to be lifted up when the worries of this world weigh us down. The Lord lifts our eyes in prayer when the problems of this life pull us down. The Lord invites us to go to him in prayer and to be reminded that this is our heavenly father and to see the amount of love that he has poured out on us. He invites us to come to him in prayer that we might be reminded of the the promises that he has made to us, the faithfulness that he has displayed, and to be assured that his justice will prevail at the time and in the way that he knows is truly best. When I was growing up, I loved to build things. Started with Legos, continued with tree houses, forts, go-karts, you name it, I wanted to build it. And when I looked at my dad's power tools, I thought to myself, you know what, I could build so much bigger, better, and faster if I could use those power tools. And so around the age of seven, I asked my dad if I could use his circular saw. And he gave me ten reasons why I couldn't. And he said, no. And so around the age of eight, I asked again. And guess what he said? No again. And I thought to myself, I've seen him use that circular saw hundreds and thousands of times. I'm sure I could do it. And so I kept on asking until around the age of 13, when he finally said, go ahead, Just be careful. Now looking back with all my fingers still attached, I completely understand why my dad said no. Even though at the time it seemed so unreasonable to me to have to wait. Sometimes the Lord answers our prayers in the same way, doesn't he? Just like my dad did, nope, not right now, just wait. And while we're waiting, we might not understand why the Lord would give us that answer. And yet waiting is never a reason to give up asking or to give up on God completely. Instead, waiting simply takes what Jesus identifies in that final question that he asks. In the question that Jesus concludes this parable with, Jesus points us to the key to successful prayer. Jesus says, 
However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Kind of a strange question to end a parable with, isn't it? And I'll admit to you, it, it kind of threw me for a loop a little bit. I mean, the answer is obvious. It's repeatedly told to us in the Bible. The answer is yes. There will be faith. There will be those who trust in Jesus when Jesus returns at the end of time. The Bible makes that clear. And so what is the point in Jesus asking that question? I think that the point is to point us to the challenge that confronts us as we bring our prayers to the Lord and they don't always seem to be successful in our opinion. Wickedness continues to go on. We still have the same problems we had. And God doesn't seem to give me exactly what I was asking for. And what's the temptation? The temptation is to stop trusting, stop asking, stop believing. And with this question, Jesus calls us to keep on trusting him. To keep on believing and leaning on him until that day when he comes back and takes us away from this world to be with him in heaven. He says successful prayer is not about you getting what you want. But rather successful prayer is about faith in the one whom you pray to. That is trusting that God will give to us what he knows is best when he knows it's best for us. And so we go to the Lord confidently and persistently and repeatedly in faith, trusting that the Lord will give to us, laying our requests before him and knowing that he will only give to us what he knows is best for us. And so my prayer for each of us this day and really always is that the Lord give us success in our prayers as we persistently pray to the Lord in faith, trusting that his will be done for us, his dearly loved children. May God grant it to us, for Jesus' sake. Amen.